I'm going to talk about a very controversial subject, which is the uh, unofficial marriages in Islam, Shiite, and Sunni. I wish to underline that I am not a specialist of Egypt, and this presentation is just to open the perspective on the issue, raise questions, especially from the Iranian viewpoint. I will first discuss the concept and application of unofficial marriages between Sunni and Shiite Islam. Then I will discuss gender life experiences in Iran and Egypt. While the political, historical, and economic situations may vary between Iran and Egypt, there are many societal similarities. The main objective of the comparative study of Iran as a, Sun as a Shiite country and Egypt as a Sunni country is to examine how individuals have practiced unofficial marriages and how the state and religious authorities manage the issue. Moreover, both countries are geopolitically and regionally important and have similar youth population profiles. The sizable young populations face issues of unemployment and costly marriage in both countries. In both countries, women are very active in the public sphere and are at the forefront of social movements. Finally, in both countries, these kinds of in unions are explicitly or implicitly sanctioned. The concept and application of unofficial marriage in, Shi in Sunni Egypt and Shiite Iran. In Shiite Islam, mut'a, marriage of pleasure, mut'a in Arabic, marriage, marriage of pleasure, and sigh in Persian, is allowed to satisfy the sexual need, needs of individuals outside of permanent marriage. It is directly linked to the question of polygyny and puts women in an un unequal situation. Today, unofficial marriage is used to respond to another problem that both Iran and Egypt are facing. Because the average age of an officially married couple is, ri is rising, Unofficial marriages are encouraged and used more frequently in both countries. Since the Arab Spring and following the youth's wishes for more sexual freedom, many Sunni scholars in the Arab world have moved towards a more liberal position on unofficial matrimonies. In Iran, the government tried to remove the veil of secrecy surrounding mut'a by promoting it as one of the most brilliant laws. A legally appropriate alternative bonu for sexual relations, a modern yet moral substitute for the decadent sexual freedom prevailing in Western countries. What follows is a brief overview of temporary marriage, of she temporary marriage. Both partners agree on the duration, which can last from a few minutes to up to 99 years. At the end of the agreed upon period, the partners part as there is no need for divorce. To those who support it, temporary marriage is a means to set limits on satisfying a national need by give it, giving it a religious legitimization. As Shahla Hayri in her book on temporary marriage puts it, religious authorities argue that despite the similarity of temporary marriage to prostitution, any kind of marriage proves obedience before the law and maintains social order. Its status, especially in terms of social acceptance, remains uncertain. For these reasons, temporary marriages are not celebrated publicly and may not be celebrated at all, even secretly. Historically, in Iranian society, the practice of temporary marriages arose in a specific context. Travel offered a special situation which prepared the ground for mut'a. It was as associated with mobility in space and more specifically with pilgrimage to holy sites. The civil code of 1928 clearly recognizes mut'a. These laws are still in effect. Before the 1979 revolution, the Family Protection Law of 1967 included some progressive protections for women in cases of divorce and polygyny, but remained silent on the questions of temporary marriage. During the Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s, martyrs' widows were encouraged to enter into mut'a with soldiers. 
This became one of the government's fa family planning tools and was promoted as was one of the um, part of a policy which was called universalization of marriage. In the 1990s, the government's support for the temporary marriages decreased, but as recently as 2007, the government started to promote it as a solution to the country's social problems, such as increasing number of divorced and single women and a rise in the marriage age. Most important non-official um, unions in Egypt. In Sunni Islam, non-permanent marriages such as Messiar, which is a traveler's marriage, and Urfi, customary marriage, are very similar to Mut'a. But the unions, uh, the unions frame time is not defined. While they may last forever, they usually end in divorce or abandonment. Urfi or customary marriage, which, is, which was not registered by the state was common in, the, in Egypt until 1930s, when its registration became officially required. It was also used in the 1960s by, the, by widowed military wives and more recently widowed, widows generally in order not to lose state provision pensions and privilege, pri privileges. Its frequency decreased for some time but has been rising for some years. In a study of more than 4,500 Egyptians aged 18 to 30, at most 6% of university students were estimated to be in such relationships. The real frequency lies somewhere between what young people are willing to admit to what their elders greatly fear. The new phenomenon of Orphi matrimonies tends to be secret and without parental knowledge, state registration, or witnesses. It has also an ambiguous uh, legal status. Miziar, or ambulant marriage, refers to a matrim matrimony where a husband visits a wife living in her parents' or her own home. Its main objective is to licitly fulfill the needs of a traveling man. This type of marriage is formally reg registered by the state and gives women and children the same inheritance rights as official marriages. The state, as the arbitrator of patriarchy, introduces laws, tries to control individual life, and is deeply committed to maintaining the gender hierarchy in place. In addition, in an unofficial marriage, power relations are reinforced. Women do not enjoy the same right as men and have the second-hand citizenship status. Gender inequalities concerning women can be found in many different areas, such as in the comparatively restricted right to divorce, difficulty in accessing work, and in an inferior status in the legal system. These and numerous other discriminatory policies have left women in a very susceptible position when it comes to unofficial unions. Secrecy surrounding these unions and the disproportionate value pl placed on virginity exer exerts great pressure on women. Despite the recent appearance of a certain sexual liberation in Iran and Egypt, the practice of unofficial marriages effectively makes women's lives less secure. Temporary marriage as, as the, the erotic discourse of Islam. Iranian case, debates on the, on, on the issue are very lively and popular in today Iran. Bef prior to 1979, the subject was sometimes debated in the, pre in the public sphere, particularly in women's magazines. We, and these magazines condemned it as, and considered it as a legalized prostitution. They provided a forum to discuss its pros and cons. This forum showed how, just how oppressing and unequal the practice is for women. These journals, um, these journals were highlighting the embarrassing situation of Mut'a women. W while the worst stories may have been 
chosen to show the difficulty for divorced or widowed women, they nevertheless emphasized the inequality of the situation for them. Generally, before the 1979, Women's Magazine reported that the majority of women were significantly against mut'a and considered it as a legalization of men's desire. Men were divided into three categories, those against it and who considered it against the incompatible with the modern world, those who were neither against it nor for it, but maintained it that it might be beneficial to the society, and those who favor it and consider it the, the most effective way to stop or prevent sexual corruption and prostitution. Men like to enter into temporary unions, but would never wish it for their daughter, sister, or any female relative. During the Arab Spring, one of the youth claims in the Arab world, and more specifically in Egypt, was for greater access to liberty in their social and sexual lives. At the time of rallies of 2011 in Tahrir Square in Cairo, banners carried such as, Mubarak must go, I want to get married. This slogan is indicative of one of the most important demands, demands of younger generations in Egypt, who much like in Iran face difficulty finding employment and might, must delay marriage due to costly weddings. In Egypt, Urfi, Urfi unions are practiced by people from various socioeconomic categories, young couples without parental consent or those who, who simply cannot afford traditional weddings. In, um, poor Egyptian girls enter, enter into Urfi unions with, with rich men of the Gulf sometimes encouraged by their parents. These are generally short-term sexual liaisons lasting from a few weeks to several months in return for money given to the bride's parents. Marriage counseling websites in Iran and Egypt. Prior to the 1979, Mut'a was not officially promoted after the revolution. After the revolution, the state started encouraging it, and Iranian media followed suit. Since the rise of the internet and social networks, there has been a proliferation of websites on Mut'a in Iran. They claim to be in conformity with civil law and Sharia. One can pay for a halal sex partner through Mut'a. According to Iranian police, there are more than 300 websites on temporary marriage arrangements. These websites explicitly offer sex partners, mostly for men, but some of them propose offers for women as well. Egyptian dating websites in, um, in Egypt, dating websites proliferated after the Arab Spring. As in Iran, they are labeled Islamic. The argument is focused focused entirely on the content and Islamic values of, of the site. The terms of use claim to be Sharia compliant, declaration of intention to marry, no photos, nor images contrary to Islam, no erotic or love language, no indecent proposal, no naughty dating, and no consummation before marriage. Applicants are from, from many Arab countries and description are less daring than the Iranian Mut'asites. In his research, Mathieu Gader emphasized that the law, lawfulness of such matrimonial services was questioned by Muslim scholars. But facing transformations of society and the pressure of the youth, the response was almost unanimous. Subject to certain conditions and safeguard practices, these websites are allowed to offer Muslim men and women such services. Islamic scholars who insist that an Islamic relationship is defined by its stable and sustainable character, how they insist that it is defined by its stable and sustainable character. However, in practice, it's, it is primarily used to conclude a temporary marriage to be able to maintain halal sexual relations. 
While some scholars believe that these types of unions evade the control of the states and religious authorities, I try to show in this paper that in Iran following the revolution of 1979 and in post-Arab Spring Egypt, both the state and religious authorities attempt to control youth sexuality by giving it a religious framework. This allows the state to exercise greater control over their, their bodies and their minds. Under the name of sexual liberation, several types of unofficial marriages, such as messiar or fi or mut'a, are practiced and are allowed and practiced. Nevertheless, entering into an unofficial marriage undermines the already fragile status of women by putting them in a precarious, unstable, and poorly perceived situation. It also reduces possibilities for remarriage as few men wish to marry a girl who already had an unofficial marriage. Besides the social stigma, unofficial marriage contradicts certain societal values. It offers a means of legalizing inf infidelity. Political, social, and economic changes that accompanied the Arab Spring have, in the eyes of many academics, resulted in a sexual liberation practice, but that does not correspond to sexual liberation or sexual emancipation for women. This sexual liberation has been taken over and monitored by religious authorities who have no other choice but to Islamicize young people's demands to maintain better control over them. Prior to the 1979 revolution in Iran, the practice of muta was limited to religious circles close to the shrines of imams, and it was looked upon officially and socially with disdain. Now, muta is officially promoted as a, le as a legitimate and desirable mean of containing the harmful and disruptive male and, to a more limited extent, female sexual derive. But it is still socially stigmatized and not accepted but many, by many Iranians. Women under the control of a patriarchal society pay once more with their bodies in an unequal situation, which negates their rights and reinforces their subordinate status. Thank you. Kheim Center, CNRS, at the University of Bordeaux, and is currently preparing her PhD in sociology on the practice of abortion in Syria. Her presentation is entitled La condition de la femme syrienne avant et après le printemps arabe. The floor is yours. Où sont maintenant les femmes syriennes? Est-ce que ces femmes qui y a dénoncé avec les hommes dans les rues, en place, pour réclamer le respect de leurs droits fondamentaux, la démocratie, la liberté politique, ont, ont elles vraiment réussi à remettre en cause la tradition, à obtenir une égalité en droit avec les hommes, dans l'espace privé comme dans l'espace public, et enfin à avoir le droit de disposer de leur corps. Dans le, cadre de cette, dans le cadre de cette présentation, nous souhaitons aborder le statut et la condition des femmes syriennes avant et après le printemps arabe, à travers l'étude d'un sujet, l'avortement, qui n'est qui sorti de l'an que récemment. Un sujet qui montre bien le décalage entre le concept, qu'elle soit religieux, législatif et social, et la réalité de la vie quotidienne des gens dans, la société, dans les sociétés arabes en général et en particulier dans la société syrienne. Il s'agit de prime d'abord de décrire les, les pratiques et les interdits de, de, de l'interruption volontaire de grossesse en Syrie avant le printemps arabe. Il s'agit ensuite de montrer jusqu'à quel point le printemps arabe aurait peut laisser, laisser, laisser apparaître 
une nouvelle pratique sociale sur ce poids, prenant en compte l'augmentation du taux de mariage précoce, le mariage forcé et de la polygamie, et laisserait par conséquent des, des empreintes négatives sur le statut de, euh, sur les statuts de, euh, de la femme, réduisant les femmes à leur fonction sexuelle du repos de guerrier et de la transmission de la vie par la maternité. Enfin, nous arrivons au droit de l'avortement sur lequel nous souhaitons donner plus de détails. L'avortement est un problème très complexe en Syrie, comme ailleurs. Il a provoqué et provoque en permanence beaucoup de controverses entre les théologiens, les juristes, les politiciens, ainsi que les acteurs de la société syrienne, eux mêmes avant le printemps arabe et après le printemps arabe. Jusqu'à présent, l'avortement est illégal, clandestin et tapou en Syrie. Il est doublement interdit par les règles des différentes religions, religions et par les lois civiles. Et par les lois civiles. Malgré cette double interdiction, les opérations d'avortement sont assez fréquentes en Syrie. Un point sur lequel je souhaite attirer l'attention par rapport à la pratique de l'avortement, euh, la, euh, la, son existence liée au principe patriarcal de cette société, c'est la domination masculine qui s'impose à toute décision liée à l'avortement. En effet, les gynécologues qui acceptent de pratiquer des avortements demandent avant tout l'accord de l'époux ou, ou nombre masculin de la famille. Donc, en son, en son absence, les femmes n'ont d'autre choix que d'avorter en secret. Voilà un aperçu rapide, rapide des pratiques et des interdits de l'avortement existant en Syrie. Dans cette société, partage par une forte tension entre logique patriarcale et logique d'individuation, une tension forte entre la modernité et la traditionnaliste, entre une apparence laïque et une réalité obsédée par la religion. Maintenant, je, euh, nous, nous essayons d'observer la situation générale des femmes syriennes après le printemps arabe, dans les zones contrôlées par le, le régime, les zones contrôlées par le groupe islamique et enfin dans le camp des réfugiés. Au travers des entretiens que, que nous avons faits avec des femmes habitantes à l'attaqué, qui est l'exemple empirique de notre recherche de, to, de thèse, sont toujours contrôlées par le régime et d'autres femmes résidentes de zones contrôlés par le groupe islamiste, ainsi que traversent des différents rapports internationaux consacrés à la situation actuelle en Syrie, nous pouvons témoigner et nous alarmer de voir la liberté volée à la femme et de la condition inférieure qui lui est réservée en permanence par une société machiste. Là, trois phénomènes méritent notre attention. Thank you, Dr. Azza. I'll uh, try to be to the point. My research is based um, on the peace theory that direct violence, social, uh, cultural violence, and structural violence is a circle that feeds into each other. And that's why I selected these three dimensions of challenges that, we, that women, Libyan women face. And how, if I want to transform this conflict, if I want to address this issue, I cannot address the direct violence without addressing the cultural and the structural violence uh, in the Libyan society. Um, the story of the Arab uprisings in the region has unfolded differently in Libya and in Syria. Um, it's, it began uh, immediately to be a violent conflict um, and a civil unrest. Libya at the moment is divided. Before even the elections of 2014, uh, tribal feuds in the southern, especially region, have been extremely violent. Um, and now Libya has a south, east, and west, uh, just exactly like um, has been divided by colonization. Um, and these three regions are facing different um, challenges. Um, I will head directly. I'll skip the introduction because I'll head directly to um, the current. 
um, situation. Um, many many uh, politicians call Libya at the moment civil war. Uh, however, I disagree. I think it's, it's one of the new wars. It's an oil war. Uh, none of the people want to win anything. They're, the Muslim Brotherhood allies uh, or the secular allies have no intention of ending the war. They are selling the oil in black markets. Um, they, are, uh, get, they are taking advantage of the immigration issue. And so there's no one really who would benefit if the war ends. Uh, therefore, it's, it's ongoing. Um, and I will, in my paper, uh, talk specifically on the women's rule by this very gendered um, conflict. Um, so nearly four years has passed here since the armed struggle at Tobol Gaddafi's regime. There's, uh, Libya is still struggling on um, the, government, the transitional government. In 2011, women in Libya broke certain social and cultural norms when they participated in the revolution. They not only took out in the streets to call for Gaddafi to stop, to step down, but they smuggled information, set up field hospitals across the region, and they also smuggled weapons to armed uh, forces. Gaddafi forces participated in various forms of gender-based violence, both against men and women. Uh, but the, the later influenced the social and political scene, both positively but most mostly negatively. As everyone knows, war rape is an endemic war crime. In a conservative society, such as the Libyan society, raping a Libyan woman simply means, in many cases, sentencing her to death, physically, psychologically, and socially. There are some reported cases. I don't want to only um, address the issues that the regime um, has subsequently done, because that will take me years. <laughs> but I will also discuss the rape cases and the sexual violence um, the rebel forces have committed against um, women and men. Um, there are no, of course, and it's impossible to get reports that will uh, actually confirm such cases. However, the Human Rights Council has affirmed allegations on these cases. The Commission has interviewed a couple of people in detention centers that were controlled by rebel forces who uh, admitted that they were sexually tortured uh, by rebel forces. So, um, as you could see, this for the fear, uh, for a, a conservative, from a very conservative perspective, the fear of reappearing these sexual incidences. Um, you could imagine what families would do to protect the women. Libyan women, and, and, as in the region, has a, the, the honor to be in the situation of being the vessel of honor. She upholds the honor of the whole family, the whole community, the whole country. And so she needs to be protected, shielded, covered, and tucked away. Um, and so, as you see, it's uh, according to IFS, a survey on Libyan status of women, 50%, 57% of women and girls between the age of 18 and 25 are restricted to leave their homes without, without male permission. The fragility of the Libyan government, of course, failed to protect these women. And so, criminal violence um, is quite predominant. Uh, the, um, the, the the fact that Libya now has a, is becoming heavily more a militarized society where every household in Libya at the moment has at least one gun, uh, whether it's for protection or if their sons are participating in the violence, 14% um, uh, of women, among 15% of them, have, are saying that they are restricted in public places um, in Libya. There have been many cases of objection and assassinations of women, even though the violence is very gendered and it's mostly men. Uh, I practiced men on, against men. Uh, however, um, this, these girls, especially in the, more than 14 um, months ago, um, more than 12, girl, more, more than 12 uh, activists, lawyers, politicians have been abducted, tortured, mutilated, raped, um, and eventually they never survive. Uh, usually they find them dead. Um, uh, and I will uh, quote very quickly that 11% of young Libyan women between age of 18 and 25 have experienced harassment and sexual harassment in public places. Uh, of course, um, this, is, this is worse uh, now with the very, very volatile situation. I can't talk about uh, the violence in public places uh, without talking about the violence at home. 
which is in, in the middle, in the region, is far worse. Um, and it's the, commit, the um, crimes committed by the fathers, the brothers, usually the protectors of the honor, uh, are far worse than what any regime uh, or any armed group would commit. Gender-based violence uh, and domestic violence is a taboo topic in Libya and within Libyan society. Uh, case, such cases and incidents can never be reported, not only that it would expose the family and the woman, but also there are no mechanisms, there are no laws or regulations that would, uh, that would make these women actually report them. Um, I cannot say, I don't have statistics to say that domestic violence has increased since 2011, uh, but if the society is militarized, if the brother used to beat using a stick or his hand, and now he has a clash and cough, you could imagine, I, I mean, I could imagine, I can never say that this is, this, but this is a perception, you could see how um, very much worse uh, the situation is. According to the IFS report, 70% of men and 60% of women in Libya think that in certain scenarios it's acceptable for the woman to be beaten by her husband or father or brother if she behaves in a such, or uh, conducts any misconduct or misbehavior that is perceived by the society. Um, I'll go to the other aspect, which is women in politics. Um, in as, as you see that uh, women uh, were accepted to, be, to participate and when they broke barriers in 2011, um, they, they faced such a big shock when in the liberation speech uh, by the head of the Transitional Council, he stated that, he has the, that the government has the full support for the rebels and that polygamy restrictions should be lifted in the Libyan law because it's against Sharia law. Uh, that's exactly the, the result of the brace. That's the only brace the Libyan women had in, the, in that speech and the only acknowledgement of their participation. Um, in 2012, uh, that, that was the first elections ever for Libya. Uh, the the uh, very various active uh, women groups tried their best to have a quota for in, um, in the elections. Um, the, it was a so-called zebra model ad adopted uh, re required par parties to list um, alternate male and female candidates. As a result, women made up 45% of the candidates nominated by political parties. Later, that was challenging in the House of Representatives in 2014, men received 170 out of 200 seats. Um, female parliaments faced on a daily basis several challenges. In their electoral campaigns, their pictures were painted with black. Uh, they were painted with uh, mustaches. Um, they uh, were completely taunted on television and refused to have their uh, interviews or any um, media public campaigns. Um, a, a block of women in um, the GNC established a committee that tried to work on women's and issues rights. Um, one of their colleagues came out on television and said that the reason why Libya is in such troubles is that God, this is God's ferry that they allowed women to participate in politics at all. That's a parliamentary colleague. Um, and uh, so it's, it was very difficult for them uh, to raise any issues that concerns women um, and uh, human rights. Um, I will skip to the third uh, section, uh, the insurgency of extremist groups. Um, now, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit, I have a reservations on the term insurgency uh, because um, Al-Qaeda has been there since the 90s um, uh, in, the, in the eastern of Libya. But with the prevailing um, atmosphere of chaos and insecurity and security vacuum, um, these, uh, these groups have completely fled, and as everyone know, um, for fi almost five, six months ago, ISIS, uh, several Libyan groups have already pledged uh, to ISIS. They have full control over CERT, which is in the center of uh, Libya, and are now creeping over one of our biggest oil fields uh, up in, this, um, in the north. These um, groups um, do not acknowledge human rights. These groups do not acknowledge women's rights. They, don't want, they won't listen to such speech. Um, and their perceptions and interpretations of Islam varies, differ uh, on the 
perceptions and interpretations of Muslim women. Even though um, many politicians uh, in Libya, or, or, um, the women, are conservative, they are uh, quite religious, their, in, their interpretations, their version of Islam, is, it's, it's not the same as these men, uh, and it will never be the same. Um, so this is a huge channel a challenge, um, not to mention the impunity uh, that these men ha have. We don't have a government, we don't have a military, we don't have a police. Not only militias um, enjoy these uh, impunities, but also these, these uh, insurgencies. I have a conclusion and recommendations, but um, I would be very happy to discuss them uh, over lunch with anyone who's interested uh, on the topic. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Az. Anyway, I'm always at a loss to understand why the status of widows continues to be so neglected, especially in conflict and post-conflict environments when we've just got such an explosion of the numbers of widows of all ages and, of course, of wives of the missing or the forcibly disappeared. And I'm really, really glad um, that you also mentioned widows in your, um, your first presentation today. Um, because interesting that this session is called the intimate sphere and I think widows are in the most intimate of intimate spheres because there's an absolutely almost taboo to even talk about it even in many women's organizations we don't talk about it but actually widows become the most vulnerable to all sorts of forms of economic and social exploitation and also, widowhood itself is a root cause of poverty and inequality across the generations. And the reasons that millions of children, boys as well as girls, but particularly girls, will be denied any future, will never go to school because of poverty and because of the stigma. And these children, it's an important issue for the whole world because the children of any country, particularly coming out of conflict, are more valuable than gold or diamonds or oil. And if we do neglect widowhood and we allow their children to be deprived of all their rights, they will become a terrible cost on their countries because it's poverty and inequality that actually promotes future conflicts and frustrates all other actions to bring about peace. I really hope that by speaking at this important conference with such incredible presentations, and which I feel quite humble to be among you, that I can get you also to place widowhood high on the peace agendas for this region. And so I thank you really much for inviting me here. Because never, never has the world seen such a huge increase in the numbers of widows. And there are never any reliable statistics. But really, these are the most vulnerable, wretched, and abused women. And widows also predominate in refugee camps and among the IDPs. There's conflict, revolution, sectarian strife, extremism, and lawlessness have actually hugely um, filled uh, host countries to refugees and, and countries among IDPs with all these women who possibly, even in a post-conflict um, situation, will never be resettled because widows carry such stigma. And very often, whatever modern laws say about equality, equal rights to inheritance, we know that custom and tradition really will take predominance over modern laws or compliance with international conventions like the CEDAW or the Beijing Platform for Action. But even in times of relative peace, widows, particularly rural widows in um, traditional communities, they lose rank and they lose status on the death of their husbands. And often they're, even the vernacular words for widows, particularly in Africa and the Middle East, they're often synonymous with prostitute, witch, sorceress, harlot. There's a terrible stigma about widowhood. Um, and we've been talking a little bit about slavery this morning, 
Well, widows are often slaves, both within their own families, when they can be inherited on the death of their husband by a, a husband's brother or a husband's cousin. They can be used as sexual slaves within a family, domestic slaves, agricultural slaves. I mean, in many, many cultures, a widow can be literally inherited as part of the chattel. I mean, she's the most stigmatized and the most poor uh, of all women. And so she's at risk within her family, and she's also at risk in the community. And all over the, wherever there's a conflict, there are always widows left to beg, forced into prostitution, and forced into selling their daughters. In this context of widowhood, we are seeing even a in huge increase in child marriage. Because when widows have to choose between who will they try and educate or keep in school, they'll choose the sons, because maybe the sons will be able to support them. In Afghanistan, they're selling their daughters, the widows, maybe for $10. And there are literally thousands and thousands of widows begging on the streets of Kabul. In Iraq, we have no idea how many widows there are. We had all the killing under Saddam Hussein. We had the widows from the Iraq-Iran war. And then we've had all the um, in, uh, invasions and occupations. And now the lawlessness, which is making um, so many more widows every day. Maybe they said um, something like, every day in Iraq at the moment, there are about 90 more widows. And uh, they say that there are 300,000 in Baghdad alone. And yet widows' voices are very rarely heard. And so even international or national policies concerned with conflict resolution and peace processes never seem to recognize that widows' voices have got to be heard in the peace tables. Yesterday we heard a lot about 1325, and we're desperately trying, my organization, to ensure that in national action plans to implement 1325 and all the subsequent resolutions of the Security Council, that actually widows' voices are heard, because when a country is coming out of conflict and new constitutions are being engrafted, there is law reform, that's the time when they really have to, through laws and changing attitudes, get widows into that process. I think, but here in Lebanon, is the first time I've ever been to Beirut, but you're home to, what, 1.3 million registered refugees, and I think many, many of the um, uh, refugees here, apart from the Palestinian regimes that you had for a long time, many of these uh, are women and children, maybe 80%, and um, many of them are widows or wives of the disappeared. Um, who've lived here since the Nakba of 1948. And your Lebanese hospitality, I know, is being stretched to the limit. <sighs> I think that 145,000 Syrian refugees' households are headed by, mainly by female heads of households, widows or wives of the missing. Um, but the... Um, at a parallel event hosted by Palestinian women at the Commission of Students of Women in March in New York this year, I was told that in Gaza, two-thirds of all the women are widows. I'm cutting and cutting to try and get the time in. Um, in this context, I'm so glad that this afternoon you'll be having Miral Sisek talking about Rojava, because Rojava in Syria, Kurdistan, is now host to 1.5 million IDPs, 80% of them women and children, many of them widows, wives of the missing, many of them victims of sexual violence, either by the Assad regime and by ISIS, by al-Nusra and other groups. And I think this is an incredible model to see what's happening in Rojava and how they really are um, supporting all women and widows to really have a voice and to be part of that, um, new, um, uh, 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 that new, unique development for um, freedom of belief and pluralism in a new Syria. Um, but I think there's another 
Um, and also, of course, in Rojava, we do have real gender equality because we have the YPG, the YPJ, and every single organization in Rojava has to have a co-chair, a man and a woman. But there's just another fact before I stop. I think that we have to face, however difficult it is, to, that, that if we've lost or killing about 5,000 ISIS fighters in the last two years in Syria and Iraq, we have to address the situation difficult as it is, of thousands more widows, including the women who were abducted and forcibly married to the fighters as trophy wives or taken in temporary marriages. Their fate is unknown, but all these women deserve our concern and help, whatever faction their dead husband was allied to or the circumstances of their marriage. And we cannot turn our backs either on the jihadi widows, the girls who come from many, many countries, including my country, the UK, who were lured there to join these terrorists. And I'll just go, we need to put marital status, I mean, you disaggregate uh, statistics, we must put marital status there. We must see that widows are represented at peace tables, law reform commissions. We want Article 5 of the CEDAW, we've got to change the attitudes to to widows. We want the UN regional office here to have a conference on widowhood in the Middle East. And we want the UN to appoint a special representative to address widowhood in conflict. And we think that the UN Secretary General should now commission a special report on widowhood in conflict, like the, on the lines of the Grasha Marshall one some years ago on children in conflict. Thank you. Our first speaker is Esmeral Chishek, a feminist, activist, and co-founder of Kurdish Women's Relations Office in Northern Iraq. She was born to a migrant Kurdish family in Germany, where she was a prominent journalist and activist. She moved to Kurdistan in 2013 aiming to strengthen the relations between different Kurdish women's organizations, as well as between Kurdish and Middle Eastern women movements. Thank you very much. So just uh, before starting, I wanted to underline that I will not speak as an uh, academic, although I have an MA in uh, political science, but more as an activist, as part of the Kurdish Women's Liberation Movement. And my speech will be about the female revolution in Rojava. And I think you are all familiar with the term Rojava, but for the one, ones who do not know, Rojava is Kurdish, it means West. And when we talk about Rojava Kurdistan, it's Western Kurdistan or Northern Syria. And uh, I will try not to speak now and then 15 minutes, so I will hurry up a bit. These remarkable women are fighting ISIS. It's time you know who they are. This was the title of an article published in the October issue of the women's magazine Mabikler. The week titled The Female Fighters of the Women's Protection Units, or YPG, The Kurdish Feminists Fighting the Islamic State. There is hardly an internationally known newspaper, magazine, or broadcaster that has not sent their reporters in recent months to Rojava, Kurdistan, or northern Syria, to document these Amazons of the 21st century. The phenomenon of armed Kurdish women fighting the Islamic State has been uncovered by the world press and the public realm due to the IS attack on the southern Kurdish or northern Iraqi predominantly Yazidi town of Sinjar or Shingar at the beginning of August and across the border to Rojava, where in September the Battle of Kobani had begun. Since then, we all have in mind the pictures of the uniformed, brave, young, smiling young, bearing arms, smiling young women, bearing arms, ready to resist any brutal attack by IS. These pictures disclosed also a kind of orientalist view, asking how it's possible that in such a retarded, feudalist, 
patriarchal society, armed women are leading the resistance against the Islamic State, which at the same time is waging a feminicide, a war against women. To understand this seemingly contradiction, we have to take a look at the revolution of Kurds in Rojava, which began in mid-July 2012, when democratic counter-institutions that had been carefully built over a long period finally came to power. The revolution of Rojava consists of two parallel processes. On one side, we have the struggle of Kurds for national liberation and self-determination. We have the armed peoples and women's protection units as defenders of the revolution against attacks both by the regime forces and fundamentalist organizations like the Nusra Front or Daesh. But on the other side, we have a struggle for the creation of an alternative system based on gender freedom, democracy, pluralism and ecology. These two processes are strongly bound together. They reflect the conviction that there can't be national liberation without social transformation. As all kinds of social hierarchies, power relations, exploitation and oppression have their roots in the enslavement of women, the creation of an alternative system that is based on freedom, equality, participation and democracy needs women to be the main subjects of this process. In short, real revolutions need to have a female character. Otherwise, they would not be able to prevent the reproduction of the existing system's structures. Revolutions are not only about demolishing existing structures, but also about creating and establishing alternative structures. In our concrete case, these need special mechanisms, consciousness, and women's empowerment. Neither the women's protection units nor the whole women's revolution in Rojava did simply fall from the sky. The revolution has a background which is often left aside. Let's firstly have a look at the ideological background. The PYD, the Democratic Union Party, as the main political force in Rojava, declared many times that even they are an independent force, they are influenced by and share the ideology of the Kurdish Freedoms Movement. The concept of democratic confederalism, as it has been developed by the imprisoned leader of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, the PKK, Abdullah Öcalan, aims to liberate society in Kurdistan by overcoming state and power structures. According to his writings, main subjects of this struggle, again, can only be women, as the 5,000 years old patriarchal statist system founded itself on the denial of women's-led socialization. Rethinking the reasons for the breakdown of real socialism, Öcalan, who started peace talks with the Turkey state in 2013, came to the conclusion that the nation-state can't be the way to freedom as it constantly reproduces power relations. That's the main reason why the Kurdish Freedoms Movement changed its strategy and concentrated on developing a communalist project in Kurdistan which is based on a democratic, ecologic, gender-liberated paradigm. Influenced by this paradigm, the democratic movement of people in Rojava is trying to establish communalist, libertarian and pluralist structures with the participation not only of all Kurds, but all ethnic and religious groups living there. The main idea is that every individual, social group and ethnic has a legitimate right of self-determination. In this context, they founded a system of canton-based democratic autonomy. Each of the cantons Kobane, Jezire and Afrin which share the social contract of Rojava cantons as a kind of constitution, has its own administration. At the head of each canton, we have co-prime ministers, a man and a woman. This co-presidency system does not only reflect the will of women, but also the different ethnics whose homeland Rojava is. 
For example, the pro co prime ministers of the Canton Jezire are a former female guerrilla fighter and the sheikh of the big Arab tribe. Every political position is assumed by co presidents. This principle has two main aims. On one hand, it ensures women's participation in decision making processes at every level, but on the other hand, this is a main mechanism for preventing the centralization of power and for democratizing politics. In all towns of Rojava, there are local people's councils and communes that aim to strengthen democratic self-government, collective will and decision making. Within all councils and also canton administrations in Rojava, there is a women's quota of 40% which aims to ensure the participation of women in the political process. Beside quantity, there are also a lot of different mechanisms to empower women qualitatively. Yekiti Astar, which is the umbrella women's movement in Rojava, is organized in nearly every village. They started to organize women at the grassroots level, making a lot of education activities where they aim to strengthen women's knowledge and consciousness in the fields of politics, health, rights, violence, culture, economics, etc. There are a lot of different women's institutions which consider themselves as part of the women's movement but work autonomously. For example, there are women's academies that educate both men and women and aim to overcome social sexism and eliminate gender discrimination by analyzing male mentality and given roles. There are women's foundations which develop social projects in answer to the needs of women. Especially the different mechanisms for social education play a key role as they are the place where the consciousness for the revolution renews itself. For example, in the academies that train defense and security forces, half the educational time is dedicated to equality of the sex. If we want to understand how it was possible for women in Rojava to give, to give their revolution a female character, we have to look at the Kurdish women's liberation movement. This movement that organizes itself in form of a confederal system called Kurdistan Women's Communities, or KGK, contains of different components embracing the whole struggle of and by women. One very essential component is the ideological party of women called Pashk, which constantly develops intellectual production, analyzes the existing patriarchal, statist, capitalist system in all its forms, and improves the women's liberation ideology. By doing so, it feeds the female activists with ideological nourishment. Another main component is the women's guerrilla army. Founded in 1995 in the mountains of Kurdistan, the women's guerrilla army, with its own structures, commandership, headquarters, training academies, etc., marks the starting point for the women's protection units in Rojava also. The women in Rojava consider the female guerrilla fighters as an example, showing that women in conflict are not only victims or perpetrators, but subjects in self-defense. Today, the YPG, with its completely independent internal structures and thousands of young women as members, exists because 20 years ago, in the mountains of Kurdistan, in spite of all internal and external difficulties and obstacles, women have built the world's, the world's first women guerrilla army. <coughs> Only in this context, it is understandable that it was possible for the women of Rojava to build up their own autonomous structures in all walks of life and struggles within the shortest possible time. Another important thing in understanding the nature of the revolution in Rojava is the concept of self-defense, particularly for women. I started my speech mentioning the pictures of YPG fighters carrying Kalashnikovs and uh, M16 weapons. But for the Kurdish freedom movement, self-defense is not only about arms. Self-defense is a principle 
of primary importance and not limited to the art struggle, although it determines the principles of the arts guerrilla struggle and the strategy of legitimate self-defense. Moreover, self-defense is seen as a way of life. It's about defending yourself, your values, your dreams, your aims against all kinds of attacks, also potential ones. It's about creating the room for these values to grow. At the end, it's about protecting life. This might look as a contradiction, but in fact, this is the dialectics of life in Kyrgyzstan and in all other parts of the world where people resist for freedom. In the, I will short it up a bit because I do not have so much time. In this context, and to come to an end, women's self-defense in Rojava and elsewhere is not only about protecting yourself with a weapon against arms, armed attacks. In a deeper sense, it's also not only about defense. It's about creating, creating life, a new life, an alternative life. If we measure the self-defense struggle of women against Islamic State in this context, then we need to see that this resistance has a universal character. ISIS is not only attacking Kurds, and not only Kurds are fighting against ISIS. ISIS, with its black flag, in its black world, tries to absorb all other colors. For this campaign, this black gang has chosen a place which has been a homeland of diversity for centuries. <coughs> I was also shorting up the part about Yazidi women, as it was mentioned. So just the last two paragraphs. If we want to understand the struggle of the Kurdish women against the ISIS, and in this context, the attacks against the ISIS and its attempts at capturing Rojava, then we must keep in mind the ideological contradictions. For in Rojava, especially in the battle for Kobani, there is a collision of two ideologies, two worldviews, two visions of the future that clash with each other. The one has the freedom of women as the center point, the other their enslavement. One has the patriarchal paradigm, the other adheres to women's liberation ideology. Therefore, and to come to a conclusion, the woman defending ISIS today in Rojava are at the forefront in creating a democratic Middle East because they are defending a new system created not by forces on power but by the people and the oppressed itself. They are forming an alternative in the Middle East sandwiched between local status quo forces, fundamentalist and neo-colonial imperialists. All the women in Rojava who, who today defend their country, their people, themselves, their dreams and their project of the new future are at the same time subjects of this creation process. They are not roses or angels or Amazons, they are women, struggling women. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to begin uh, by some clarifications uh, that um, uh, are an accumulation from previous presentations. Uh, because my topic is very sensitive, as you know, when it comes to suicide and martyrdom, so sometimes I use these interchangeably as the people concerned use them. Another clarification, as uh, Dr. Carol Mann has said, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. And I would like to quote the late French professor, Jean-Paul Sartre, who said that terrorism is the atomic bomb of the poor. He said this in 1974. And lastly, I am quoting Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa. It is my conviction that if we are neutral in situations of injustice, we have chosen the side of the oppressor. The world must learn about respect, listening and forgiveness. So all of us ought to be social or political activists. With these notes, I will try to shed some light, a snapshot of reality on three different types of female suicide bombers. I will start with the Palestinians. 
a survey conducted by Reuters on the Palestinian reaction to its suicide operations conveyed that 75% of the Palestinians support the 4 October 2003 suicide operation, the sixth operation conducted by a Palestinian woman since the beginning of the Intifada or uprising. The operation conducted by the lawyer Hanadi Jaradat, who blew herself up killing 20 Israeli civilians in the wake of the celebration of Yom Kippur, Day of Forgiveness in Haifa, a city that is supposed to portray Israeli-Palestinian peaceful coexistence. The sample included 13, 18 Palestinians from the West Bank and Gaza, out of whom 17% were against the operation and 4% vehemently condemned it. The late Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, founder of Hamas, argued, quote, I am saying that in this phase of the uprising, the participation of women is not needed, like men. We cannot meet the growing demands of young men who wish to carry out martyrdom operations, end of quote. On 14 January 2004, at the Iraq's crossing in Gaza, Reem Saleh Riyashi, the seventh women suicide bomber and the first Palestinian mother blew up herself among Israeli soldiers, killing and wounding seven. In laying Reem to rest, Mahmoud Zahar, Hamas political leader, declared, quote, the martyr Reem is a heroine since she gave up everything. This was a young married woman who left behind a husband and children to go to paradise, etc. She won't be our last. Although Sheikh Yassin earlier argued that it is not essential for women to participate in suicide operations, in spite of the growing number of male contest contenders, it seems he revoked his decision later on due to alterations dictated in the battlefield. In commenting on Ariyashi's operation, he said, quote, the operation is a watershed operation on two counts. First, because a woman executed it, the first woman from Hamas to conduct such an operation. Second, because it resulted from a joint endeavor between Kata'ib Shahada Al-Aqsa, which is um, an offshoot of the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade under the PLO command, and Kata'ib Azadim Qassam, i.e. the military wing of Hamas. In justifying women's role in jihad and martyrdom, Yassin argued that when the enemy occupied the land of the Muslims, jihad became a religious duty upon all Muslims, men and women. He re reiterated, we used to say in the past that we leave women aside unless there is an urgent need for them to conduct martyrdom operation. Thus, when our brothers in Qatar found the need to perform an operation by resentment to women, they did so because, in my opinion, it is a new beginning for women. However, conducting jihad is not the beginning, rather the continuity of the road to martyrdom and struggle by recourse to both men and women. Now, I will go to another snapshot of reality. This time, it's from my field work, where I interviewed a Hezbollah's martyr's mother. Uh, the title invokes Goethe's Faust, Prologue in Heaven, the Martyr's Mother. On, uh, on a sunny Sunday of 9 May 1999, Naimi Bieri and Vicky Toft and the author went to interview the mother of a Hezbollah martyr in the southern suburb of Beirut in a, in a humble, barely standing home. The two Danish journalism students experienced, quote unquote, a cultural shock when they learned that they had to congratulate the mother instead of offering her their condolences. I was not surprised, but the Danes seemed to be perplexed. They questioned how one could congratulate a mother on the loss of her own son. How could a caring, loving mother give her own son willingly to death? The visible astonishment of the Danes, however, was a serious challenge to the illiterate mother. mother she said, Quote, my daughters, if you were bitten by a snake and the poison is flowing in your bloodstream, will you let it go all the way to your heart and kill you, or will you simply suck it out? Close quote. She gave another analogy. She said that if a person discovered a cancerous gland in his or her body, would not he or she remove it 
from the room so as not to kill him. She showed us some pictures of her son without shedding a single tear. Rather, she was cool in healing up manner. In particular, she argued, quote, dignity is the opposite of humiliation and death is preferable to humiliation, end of quote. She added that the martyr, her son, quote, acted as an anti stand, a bronze hawk, a hardcore Artemis, whose greatest duty and source of pride, honor and dignity is to sacrifice himself for the being, for the well-being of his country by killing as many as possible of his enemies. She stressed that this is the greatest pride that can befall a mother. Now I move to another question. Do only Islamist movement engage in, in martyrdom or in suicide? It is worth mentioning that self-sacrifice, martyrdom or suicide operations are not confined to Islam. There are nationalistic types of martyrdom that have little or even nothing to do with religion but with the struggle of national independence. For example, the Chinese communists during the insurrection in Shanghai in 1927, the Japanese kamikaze in World War II, the liberation Tamil Tigers LTTE in Sri Lanka and India, the Kurdistan Workers' Party, PKK, in Turkey, Barbar Kashla International, BKI of India, and many others resorted to suicide operations. As far as I know, the Chinese communists are Buddhist or Confucius. The Japanese kamikazes are Shinto and Buddhist. The LTT is mainly composed of Hindus and few Christians. The PKI are Sikh. The LTT has conducted one suicide operation in India. It is the only group to have killed two world leaders. The former Prime Minister of India, Rajiv Gandhi, and the President of Sri Lanka, using both male and female suicide bombers. Um, between 1980 and 2000, for instance, the LTTE conducted 168 suicide operations, while the PKK conducted 22 which outweigh by far all suicide operations conducted in Israel and Lebanon during that period. In the Middle East, the Lebanese case exemplifies both threats, Islamists and nationalist suicide or martyrdom. Compared to Iranian and Palestinian case, Farhat Khosrafavar classifies the Lebanese case as ambivalent, wavering between martyrdom and absurd death because of the multi-confessional sectarian name and nature of the Lebanese myriad. According to him, this, along with the Israeli invasions, created a prosperous ground for martyrdom. I turn attention to the fact that in the Lebanese case, Hezbollah was the only political party that conducted 12 martyrdom or suicide operations against Israeli forces using 12 males. There were no females at all. But Hezbollah had fierce competition from secular, multi-confessional Lebanese political parties, such as the rightist Syrian nationalists, the, the leftist Lebanese Communist Party, the Ba'ath Party, the Nasserites, especially in the years from 1985 to 1990. While Hezbollah conducted 12 martyrdom operations by Shia males, the Syrian nationalists and the Lebanese Communists performed martyrdom operations by both males and females of different religious denominations. Uh, I begin with the Syrian uh, na nationalist martyrdom operations. Uh, although Khosrokovar explains the religious motivation behind Hezbollah's martyrdom operations and the nationalistic or political motivation behind secular political parties' motivation, in the Syrian nationalist case, he seemed to imply that Sana'a Haidi, the 17 year old Shiite girl, was the only um, SSMP martyr. I argue that, like Hezbollah, SSMP conducted 12 martyrdom operations in total, which included, in addition to Sana, five other women. Thus, it seems that Khosrokhovar stresses religious capital, but is misinformed about or sidelines the 11 other martyrdom operations, which, in addition to Shia, were carried out by Sunni Druze and even Christians. I would like to stress the nationalistic aspect and the multi-confessional nature of nationalistic identity rather than limiting it to one sect. My hypothesis is try pro pro proving that, for instance, the Syrian nationalists and the Lebanese Communist Party and Shiite mar martyrs um, sacrificed their lives not as absurd death, 
but as symbolic capital in order to uphold the honor and dignity of their nature, nation and liberate their land, as was the case with other martyrs. Another contention and overgeneralization made by Hosso Khavar concerning Muslim and secular martyrs is that he argues that most of the martyrs came from poor, deprived classes or gra grassroots of South Lebanon. Based on fieldwork research, I found out that most of the martyrs were middle class. Some even had university education. Also, I have discovered that the martyrs came from different geographical locations in Lebanon, and not predominantly from South Lebanon, as Hosr Khadar asserts. In the SSNP case, I was told that at least four martyrs had university education, and they came from the middle class. One of them was even an aristocrat Christian. As mentioned earlier, the SSMP suicide operation are based on its political ideology. That's why the SLSP mar martyrs were not only Lebanese, but also included Syrians and Palestinians. The SLSP Sana Amhaydi, called the quote unquote the bride of the South, uh, she was 17, is one of the most celebrated women martyrs. She was 17 when he, she blew herself up in 1985 in an Israeli patrol. Another case in point is illustrated by the Lebanese Communist Party upper middle class Christian Lola Abud, the flower of the Bikar. A courageous woman, I'm quoting now, who fought for her land and for her people and went to her death willingly. Abud's only devout Christian family had already produced a long line of warrior martyrs. Lola came from a village where Christians and Muslims live side by side in harmony and peaceful coexistence. Abu became the ideal martyr for Palestinian women martyrs to emulate. She had already paved the way in Lebanon. According to her brother, Lola was the family's last martyr when she grew herself up in, the, in her village on 20th of April, 1985. Uh, comparing uh, Lola Abud to a modern Joan of Arc, it is fair to say that Lola Abud's actions exceed all expectations not only for women in war, but for men as well. This is Davis in her book, she this quotation. Since her martyrdom took place the day after Easter, it could be argued that her death served as a resurrection to her people. David adds, that both Lola's mother and her brother did not perceive any antagonism between Lola's death and their strong Christian belief, even though Christianity, like Islam, forbids suicide. Um, I will conclude now. Um, Hosra Khadar argues that the thematics and discourses of Lebanese martyrs, both secular and Shia, are similar to the Iranian Shiite martyrs and to the Palestinian martyrs' discourses. The similarity is that all believe in the same values of combating the enemy through suicide martyrdom that originates from a will to die and desire of immortality. Hosra Khavar adds, for the Shiites, it is God's encounter that is realized by combating an infidel enemy. For the nationalists and communists, Immortality is achieved either by identification <coughs> with the collectivité nationale or identification with all the poor or deprived in the world. On the sentence, I subscribe to the view that stresses the individually driven nature of suicide bombers, arguing that they can be educated and uneducated, religious and secular, comfortably off and destitute. Their link is the decision they make to transform their powerlessness into extraordinary power. The martyrdom or suicide of Islamist movement or resistance movements or other nationalistic movements are altruistic self sacrifice uh, operations conveyed in the form of symbolic capital in order to end what they call the disgrace and hum humiliation that befalls the nations. Thank you.
and uh, second, I have to I have to admit that I'm trained as a social anthropologist, and that means that um, field work uh, is sine uh, of my science, um, social science, and at this particular case, uh, I have to apologize for my asymmetrical research because. Uh, I am scrutinizing two cases, and one of the cases is um, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, women participation in war and armed conflict, and another case is a Kurdish case uh, of Peshmerga. And uh, I, actually, I want to say that I, I did, I conducted eight months. Uh, field work and participant observation in Nagorno Karabakh, in Nagorno Karabakh, and um, I had just library research to to know more about Bishmerga. So please, this is limitations. So my paper explores the phenomenon of women at war as one fundamental but neglected dimension of military history at the intersections of gender, nationalism, institutions, patriarchy, ideology. In particular, this paper examines change in gender relations as a result of women involvement in armed conflicts throughout the world, namely in the Asia Minor and South Coast. Subsequently, the experiences of two groups of women are considered uh, women fighters of Karabakh and, and Kurdish PKK's women battalions called Pishmerga. Uh, the focus of, uh, is on two essential issues, um, reconfiguration and redefinition of women participation in warfare in modern time and the Arab Spring paradigm shifting discourses. The experience of women soldiers before, during, after participation in micro level, and if I have time in macro level too. And my research questions are, is the women participation as a war agent a culmination of women subjectivity? In this way, the aim of the paper is to contribute to the debates on the role of women in armed conflict and the far more consequences of those challenging uh, transformations for change in gender relations. Uh, another section, uh, next section, is going to be on uh, what research questions and dilemmas I faced during, during my study. The symbolic power of women in these two societies is well described in academic literature. This sort of power is regulated by common law, uh, adapt in Caucasus and some kind of honor code in Kurdistan. Many Kurdish women, uh, I'm quoting, many Kurdish women marched between Suleymaniye and Erbil in 1994 to demand peace and reconciliation between the two parties. Nationalism, nationalism and feminism, uh, nationalism and feminism are in ambiguous relationship. Oh, next slide, please. Yeah, and are in ambiguous relationships. Uh, in both research, so in, in both, both research sites, feminism as a phenomenon and a discourse of um, and a discourse is quite is quite stigmatized. Um, and my paper contains strong comparative dimension, which shows the universal nature of considered social processes. Um, I just wanted to, to outline what I'm going to talk about because I feel already I'm not going to manage. <laughs> so uh, just what I'm going to focus on, 
methodology, more or less, I explained that. That was um, empirical data I'm based on in one case and library research in another case. And um, case study. In Armenian case, I, I took only one, I, I, I took about 100 cases, but I go deeper into one case of Shushani Fahmazian. Uh, who born in 1961, and I, 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 um, I suppose this case is sort of typical, and, and um, I find this method really very effective. So, um, one of the uh, important dilemma is also that what is the difference between participation in, in war when woman woman is transgressing her gender, her traditionally prescribed gender role, and um, when uh, and when she does not transgress that role, that means that m many of those 100 women would be inside of the gender role of. of traditional role. I mean, they wouldn't go out of that role. They, they would serve as uh, nurses, they would serve as um, co cooks and uh, bread, <coughs> bread, um, bread bakers. So, and with, with these women, with their status, everything is perfectly okay. And only <coughs> women who would take, uh, take uh, liberty and courage to to um, act as an um, active agent of war, they would have great problem uh, later on <laughs> to be recognized as uh, as a subject of policy <laughs> and just uh, one of the community members. So, um, Nationalism and feminism are in ambiguous relationships. In both research, research sites, feminism as a phenomenon and the discourse is quite stigmatized, as I say. And my paper uh, going, is going to go deeper into two cases. And one can see their remarkable similarities and, and conspicuous peculiarities. The fighter may seem cut off from the outside the world, but both groups are well funded by international sources, by Armenian diaspora and Kurdish expatriates uh, of all over the world, or other external sources. Motivations for the military activism are another important locus of the study. Both groups of women soldiers are bearer of idealistic philosophy uh, so, uh, at the same time, their life strategies are directly uh, dictated by survival problems. And what this decline is, is paramount to survival. Rightful struggle and ethnic revenge are the centers of those mindsets. The vibrant, the, the vibrant, vibrant involvement of political parties like Dashnak and PKK is another form shaping factor. Abdullah Jalan declared the women combatant groups a, a women's party, quote unquote, women's party. Uh, he said, we have, to we have to develop women to create a new society. At the same time, it emerged a male um, opponency and even antagonism. It's, it's like It's like um, it's like boomerang that makes combat tougher on men. It was hard for the men to accept this, and male combatant of, of both groups have admitted this in in different contexts. Differences in the cases reveal in the domain of uh, structuralization of special units. In Harabagh, the women fighters were individualist 
one loneliness that came from below bottom up. In Kurdish case, they are institutionally embedded. Does it mean that the former are marginalized upstarts and the latter are future heroes cherished by the significant uh, others? What are their relationship with traditional rules and ideological system? Um, next section is narratives on nation, feminism and conflict and, and relationship in, uh, between this these concepts. The essential question of whether nationalism and feminism are <coughs> compatible or mutually exclusive has been a source of contestation among feminist, feminist scholars. However, in colonial and post-neocolonial contexts, the picture that emerges in more complex, is more complex. Here we refer to those women struggling for a greater role for women in this public, in the public sphere and a greater allocation of resources or opportunities for women or the end of gender discrimination in legislation as women's rights activists. So in, in the frame of feminist debates, another part of feminist scholars say nationalism can facilitate women's agency and empowerment in a context where grassroots mobilization rather than military struggle is a key movement strategy and the, uh, the movement's ideology supports women's equality as illustrative uh, of the movement's modernity. In the Middle East, researchers often find nationalism uh, entwined with religion and hostile to the notion of women's liberation within a modernist paradigm. For example, Islamist movements struggling against nominally secular authoritarian regime, regimes and foreign occupation often advocate conservative gender norms, including veiling for women and reform of family laws in line with conservative interpretations, while simultaneously mobilizing the women as part of those movements. On the other hand, Armenian feminist scholars show that during the first Armenian Dashnak's Republic, women were, uh, were vastly, vastly vastly involved in the nation building processes like Zabel Yesayan, Serpuhi Tusab, and first women diplomat Diana Apka, who was representative of the first Armenian Republic in Japan. Res respectively, Marco Badran demonstrates that Egyptian feminists in the early 20th century worked within the framework of Islam and advanced the national cause. Um, Moja, referring to the Iraqi Kurdish context, argues that Islamist nationalist movement and secular nationalism both stand in the way of transformative gender politics and hinder a feminist analysis of and struggle against gender-based violence and inequality. Um, rather than conceptualizing nationalism and feminism as either contradictory or compatible frames of reference, for these two nationalistic movements, it seems as attempts to narrate what, what, the Armenian Kurdish nation, particularly in response to the realities of the external threat to physical existence. The Kurdish nationalism scholar contends that nationalism per se is not an obstacle to women's right, at least in Iraqi Kurdistan, as well as in the facto Nagorno-Karabakh Republic. I have plenty of um, slides to show you, but unfortunately I think there is no time to do that. Uh, this is why I'm going to just skip lots of things and go to the conclusion, which is I'm not going to read anymore because I guess I haven't 
for maybe two more minutes. Um, so my conclusions are that in case of Pishmerga, we cannot uh, do any conclusion right now because it, everything is in the process. But in case of Haraba, as I told, uh, women who the out of their gender roles, I mean, out of uh, uh, who transgress these borders between male and female domains, they had really hard time. And it's really very closely can be, can be seen with, in, in this case study with Shushanik Tachmazian. And, and um, let me say that under the extreme war conditions, women, woman soldier was tolerated only to be denounced again after the war. Thus, the history of Shushanik is an important main, uh, manifestation of the weak attempt accompanying war and post-war communities to revise established gender order. Viewing the work of women through the prism of masculine values greatly, greatly impeded the organization of a serious feminist movement in the region. In this sense, nation building, a process which, which has been resumed in Harabah with a new power uh, in the aftermath of socialism, is accompanied by conflict at the intersection of ethnicity and gender. And it, it seems to me there is not that kind of there is not that kind of conflict in, in Kurdish society. At least it's not uh, explicit. It's implicit. So um, mm, this conflict is reflected very clearly in the statement of Jean Nagalstian, advisor of the president of Nagorno Karabakh Republic, on cultural issues. In response to my question about what she thinks of women's solidarity <coughs> in the region, Galstian, with a poorly concealed indignation, replied with another question. Why divide the nation into men and women? Thank you. <laughs>